Welcome back to our channel. Today we're diving deep into the bizarre and sometimes downright strange history of medicine. Buckle up, because we're about to explore 10 weird facts that will make you appreciate modern healthcare all the more. From the Renaissance period's peculiar use of mummy powder to the shocking lobotomy procedures of the 20th century, we're journeying through time to uncover some of the most unusual practices that have shaped the way we understand and approach medicine today. Picture this. You're in ancient Greece, and your doctor is analyzing the color, smell, and even taste of your urine to diagnose your ailment. Or perhaps you're in medieval times, sitting in a barber's chair not for a haircut but for a tooth extraction or bloodletting. Intrigued? You should be. So without further ado, let's start with fact number one. In the Renaissance period, ground-up mummies were believed to have medicinal properties. Despite its questionable origins, mummy powder was used in various remedies and potions. Yes, that's right, ground-up mummies. The practice, known as mumia, was quite popular during the Renaissance. This was a time of rapid scientific discovery, but also of bizarre medical practices. The belief was that the preserved bodies of the ancient Egyptians held powerful healing properties. The mummies were typically procured from Egypt, often through less than scrupulous means. Grave robbing was not uncommon, and there was a thriving black market for these ancient remains. Once obtained, the mummies were ground into a fine powder, creating the so-called mummy powder. This powder was then used in a variety of medicinal concoctions. It was believed to have a range of curative properties. It was used to treat everything from headaches and stomach ailments to more serious conditions like epilepsy and gout. Some physicians even believed it could slow down the aging process, a kind of ancient elixir of life. But it wasn't just physical ailments that mummy powder was used for. It was also thought to be a useful treatment for mental disorders. The rationale behind this was the belief in the balance of the four humors, black bile, yellow bile, phlegm, and blood, a theory that dominated medical thinking at the time. But as we know now, mummy powder had no real medicinal properties. The practice eventually fell out of favor as medical science advanced and the use of human remains for medicine became ethically and morally unacceptable. Today, the idea of using ground-up mummies as medicine seems both macabre and absurd. Yet, the story of mummy powder serves as a fascinating glimpse into the history of medicine. It shows us how far we've come in our understanding of the human body and how we treat its many ailments. And that brings us to our next bizarre fact. Ancient civilizations actually drilled or scraped holes into skulls as a treatment for ailments. The reasons behind this practice remain somewhat unclear, but it certainly gives getting a hole in your head a whole new meaning. Let's take a closer look. This practice, known as trepanation, dates back to prehistoric times and was widespread among ancient civilizations. Imagine this. You're feeling unwell, perhaps suffering from migraines or seizures, and the solution is to drill a hole into your skull. It's a bit hard to fathom from our modern perspective, isn't it? The methods varied from culture to culture. Some used sharp stone tools, others had specialized bronze instruments. The procedure involved scraping away at the bone until a hole was formed. Quite often, the patient was fully conscious throughout. Yes, you heard that right. Anesthesia was not generally a part of the process. So, what was the reason behind such a drastic measure? Theories abound, from the belief that evil spirits were trapped inside the head and needed a way out, to the idea that it could cure various ailments such as headaches, epilepsy, and even mental disorders. There's also evidence to suggest it might have been used in rituals or as a means of capturing an enemy's power. While it may sound barbaric to us today, it's fascinating to note that many of those who underwent trepanation survived the procedure. We know this because their skulls show signs of healing around the trepanation holes. This suggests that ancient practitioners must have had some knowledge of how to prevent infection and promote healing. It's also worth mentioning that trepanation isn't entirely a thing of the past. It's still performed today, albeit in a much more controlled and regulated environment, primarily to relieve pressure on the brain following trauma. But before you start imagining a drill approaching your skull, let me reassure you. Modern medicine has come a long way since those ancient times. We now have sophisticated neurosurgical techniques and treatments for the conditions that might once have led to trepanation. Now let's move on to our next weird fact. In ancient Greece, physicians analyzed a patient's urine to diagnose medical conditions. Yes, you heard that right. The color, smell, and taste of urine were considered important indicators of health. Now let's dive into the details. This practice, known as uroscopy, was a central part of ancient Greek medicine. Physicians would examine the urine's color, consistency, 
and even its sediment to diagnose various ailments. Dark urine might indicate dehydration, while cloudy urine could suggest a kidney issue. The smell of the urine was also considered. A sweet smell, for instance, could indicate the presence of sugar, a sign of what we now know as diabetes. But it didn't stop there. Some physicians took the analysis a step further and tasted the urine, a practice that might make us cringe today. But back then, a sweet taste was another confirmation of diabetes, while a salty taste could be a sign of kidney disease. The practice of uroscopy was so widespread that containers called matuli were specifically designed for this purpose. These glass vessels, often shaped like wine bottles, allowed physicians to examine the urine against the light, enhancing their ability to observe its characteristics. This method of diagnosis was not exclusive to Greece. It was also practiced in other parts of the world, including ancient India and the Islamic Golden Age, where physicians developed charts correlating urine color with specific diseases. Despite its oddity to us, uroscopy was an innovative diagnostic tool for its time. It was an early form of laboratory medicine, providing valuable insights into the patient's internal state. However, it was not infallible. Misinterpretations were common, leading to incorrect diagnoses and treatments. As science progressed, urinalysis evolved into a more refined and accurate process. Today, we use sophisticated lab tests that measure various components of urine, providing a wealth of information about a patient's health. But we must remember, it all started with a simple look, sniff, and sometimes, a taste. With that, let's move on to our next bizarre fact. Before antibiotics, ancient Egyptians and Greeks used moldy bread containing natural penicillin to treat infections. Who knew your grandma's old bread could be a potential lifesaver? Yes, you heard that right. In a time long before the discovery of modern antibiotics, moldy bread was a go-to treatment for infections. This surprising fact makes us realize that our ancestors were more resourceful than we might think. Now let's delve deeper into this. The ancient Egyptians were known for their advanced medical knowledge. They realized that when they applied a piece of moldy bread to wounds, the infection rate decreased significantly. They may not have understood why this happened, but they knew it worked, and that was enough. Similarly, the Greeks, being the curious minds they were, also observed this phenomenon. They too started using moldy bread on wounds, and even on people suffering from diseases we now know to be bacterial infections. This practice was widespread and was documented in various ancient texts. So, what was the magic ingredient in this moldy bread? Well, it turns out that the mold growing on the bread was a type of penicillium, a fungus that produces penicillin. Yes, the same penicillin that we use today to treat various infections. It's a naturally occurring antibiotic that inhibits the growth of bacteria, making it an effective tool in fighting infections. Fast forward to the year 1928, when scientist Alexander Fleming made the groundbreaking discovery of penicillin. He observed that mold from his unwashed petri dishes killed bacteria, leading to the development of the first true antibiotic. The moldy bread of the ancients had come full circle in the modern era, saving countless lives. Just imagine, without the intuitive wisdom of those ancient civilizations, we may not have stumbled upon one of the most significant discoveries in medical history. It's fascinating how a simple piece of moldy bread could hold such potential. And now let's move on to something truly shocking. In the 20th century, lobotomies were performed as a psychiatric treatment. Yes, you heard me right. It involves severing connections in the brain's prefrontal cortex. Yikes. Let's delve into the details. The procedure, also called lochotomy, was first performed in the late 1930s. It was considered a revolutionary approach to treating mental disorders particularly for patients with severe symptoms. The idea was to calm patients' behaviors by cutting the connections between the prefrontal cortex and the rest of the brain. The prefrontal cortex, you see, is the part of the brain involved in planning complex cognitive behavior, personality expression, decision-making, and moderating social behavior. By severing these connections, doctors believed they could alleviate symptoms of mental disorders and improve patients' quality of life. The procedure was quite invasive. It involved drilling holes into the patient's skull, inserting a sharp instrument like an ice pick, and then moving it back and forth to cut the connections in the brain. It sounds quite terrifying, doesn't it? But here's the kicker. Lobotomies were often performed without anesthesia. Patients were usually sedated with electroconvulsive therapy or placed into a semi-conscious state using insulin shock therapy before the procedure. 
the after effects of lobotomy were profound and often devastating. While some patients did experience reduction in symptoms, many others were left with severe cognitive and emotional impairment. They experienced changes in personality, became apathetic, and lost their ability to function independently. By the 1950s, the use of lobotomies began to decline as the procedure was criticized for its inhumane nature, and the introduction of antipsychotic medications provided a less invasive treatment option. Today, the procedure is considered one of the most controversial in the history of medicine, a stark reminder of how far we've come in understanding and treating mental health conditions. Now, let's move on to our next weird fact. In the 18th century, tobacco smoke enemas were used to treat various conditions, including respiratory ailments. Imagine telling your doctor, I'm feeling a bit wheezy, doc, past the bellows. Now, that might sound like a punchline, but it's a genuine snippet from our medical past. During the 1700s, blowing tobacco smoke up one's rectum was considered an effective treatment. This practice was especially common in England and its colonies, where it was often used as a resuscitation method for drowning victims. The warmth of the smoke was thought to promote respiration, but doubts about the credibility of tobacco enemas led to the popular phrase, blowing smoke up your ass. The equipment used for these procedures was known as a tobacco resuscitator. It consisted of a fumigator and a set of bellows. The fumigator would heat the tobacco to create smoke, which was then injected into the patient's rectum using the bellows. The rationale behind this treatment was the belief in the healing properties of tobacco smoke. It was thought to have the ability to dry out the humors in the body, thereby restoring health. The practice was so prevalent that tobacco resuscitators were hung alongside life buoys on the River Thames to save drowning victims. However, as medical understanding advanced, the use of tobacco smoke enemas gradually fizzled out. By the early 19th century, it became clear that the practice was not only ineffective, but also potentially harmful. The nicotine in the tobacco smoke was found to be toxic, particularly in the high concentrations created by the enema. As we look back, it's clear that our understanding of medicine has come a long way. From blowing smoke up the rectum to understanding the complex workings of the human body, we've certainly made some strides. But as we chuckle at the oddity of tobacco smoke enemas, let's also remember how these strange practices paved the way for the medical advancements we enjoy today. And with that, let's move on to our next bizarre fact. Believe it or not, mercury was once thought to have healing properties and was used to treat everything from syphilis to digestive issues. Spoiler alert, it caused more harm than good. Journey back with me to a time when mercury, yes, that silvery shiny liquid metal, was considered a cure-all. It was the medieval era when mercury started to make its appearance in the world of medicine. The belief was that this shimmering element had the power to cure a range of ailments, including syphilis, a widespread and dreaded disease of the time. Mercury was administered in various forms, from ointments to pills, and even vapor baths. It was thought to be a miracle substance that could drive out diseases from the body. But as we now know, this supposed cure was a silent killer in disguise. Despite its mesmerizing appearance, mercury is a potent neurotoxin. Prolonged exposure or consumption can lead to mercury poisoning, causing a slew of health issues like tremors, mood swings, nerve damage, and even death. But back then, the connection between mercury treatments and these health problems was not made. Instead, the worsening of health was often attributed to the disease itself, not the so-called cure. This misunderstanding allowed mercury to continue its reign in the medical field for centuries. It wasn't until the late 19th century when the harmful effects of mercury were finally recognized and its use in medicine began to decline. So, while mercury might have given false hope to many in the past, today it's recognized for what it truly is, a dangerous substance that has no place in medicine. It's quite a sobering thought, isn't it? How something once heralded as a miracle cure turned out to be a silent killer. It's a stark reminder of how far we've come in our understanding of health and medicine. Now, let's talk about something truly shocking. In the 20th century, electroconvulsive therapy, or ECT, was used to treat mental disorders. Today, it's still employed, but in a more controlled and regulated manner. Talk about shocking treatments. This is our ninth stop on this fascinating journey of medical history, electric shock therapy. Now brace yourself for a truly electrifying tale. In the early part of the 20th century, electric shock therapy, often known as electroconvulsive therapy or ECT, became a prevalent method of treating severe mental disorders, including schizophrenia and depression. 
The process involved passing small electric currents through the brain, intentionally triggering a brief seizure. It was believed that these seizures could cause changes in brain chemistry that could quickly reverse symptoms of certain mental health conditions. Quite a shocking approach, wouldn't you agree? In the beginning, ECT was administered without anesthesia, and the patient would be fully conscious during the procedure. This often led to side effects such as memory loss, fractured bones, and other serious injuries. As you can imagine, this method of treatment was met with much controversy and criticism, with many advocating for its abolishment. However, with advancements in medical technology and a more profound understanding of mental health, ECT has evolved over time. Today, it's administered under general anesthesia, and muscle relaxants are used to prevent physical injury during the induced seizures. The procedure is now much safer and is considered an effective treatment for severe depression that hasn't responded to other therapies. Despite its controversial past, ECT has proven to be a life-saving treatment for many, helping those with severe mental illnesses when other treatments have failed. It's a testament to how far we've come in the field of medicine, transforming a once shocking and terrifying procedure into a regulated, controlled, and vital treatment. And now let's move on to our next weird fact. Yes, you heard that correctly. Radithor, a radioactive water, was marketed in the early 20th century as a cure-all elixir. Now before you start raising your eyebrows, let's delve a little deeper into this peculiar piece of medical history. The advent of the Roaring Twenties brought with it a fascination for all things novel and exciting. Radioactivity was one such intrigue. Discovered by Madame Curie at the turn of the century, it was still a relatively new and mysterious concept. When William J. A. Bailey, a Harvard University graduate, came across radium, he saw an opportunity and created Radithor. Radithor was essentially distilled water infused with minute amounts of radium. It was marketed as a health drink, promising to boost vitality and treat a plethora of ailments ranging from arthritis to impotence. The tagline Perpetual Sunshine implied it would imbue users with ceaseless energy. It was the Red Bull of the 1920s, if you will. However, the sunshine quickly turned into a storm. Consumers of Radithor began to experience severe health issues. The most famous case was that of Eben Byers, a wealthy American socialite and industrialist, Byers was a strong advocate for Radithor until his death in 1932, which was directly attributed to his consumption of the radioactive tonic. His gruesome demise, which involved bone decay and organ failure, was a chilling testament to the lethal effects of radiation poisoning. The tragic case of Byers led to a public outcry and a subsequent clampdown on such harmful patent medicines. It was a sobering lesson in the dangers of unregulated marketing and the misuse of scientific discoveries. Radithor's deadly legacy served as a catalyst for stronger regulations in the pharmaceutical industry, and it underscored the importance of rigorous testing and validation of medical products. And finally, let's talk about medieval barber surgeons. In medieval times, barber surgeons performed a range of medical procedures, from bloodletting to tooth extraction. That barber pole with its red and white stripes? It's a symbol of their historical association with these practices. Who knew your barber had such a colorful past? Indeed, in the days of yore, when knights and castles defined the landscape, the barbershop was more than just a place to get a quick trim. It was a one-stop shop for all sorts of medical procedures. You see, the barber surgeons were the jack-of-all-trades in the medical field. Their services weren't just limited to giving you a clean shave or a neat haircut. They were also the go-to professionals for bloodletting, a common practice believed to balance the body's so-called humors, blood, phlegm, black bile, and yellow bile. The barber surgeons would cut into a vein, allowing blood to flow out, supposedly taking with it the disease or ailment troubling the patient. Now, tooth extraction was another service offered by these medieval practitioners. With no proper dentistry available, people would turn to their local barber surgeon to have troublesome teeth yanked out. Unsurprisingly, this was a far cry from today's painless dental procedures. And if that wasn't enough, barber surgeons also performed surgeries. They would stitch up wounds, amputate limbs, and even conduct autopsies. With no formal medical training, these procedures were often a gruesome affair, and survival rates were alarmingly low. The barber pole that we see today, with its spiraling red and white stripes, is actually a nod to these barber surgeons. The red represents the blood associated with their surgical duties, while the white symbolizes the bandages used to dress wounds. So, the next time you're sitting in the barber's chair, Remember the rich history of these practitioners. They were the precursors to modern healthcare professionals, providing essential services in a time when medicine was still in its infancy. 
And there you have it, folks. 10 weird facts about the history of medicine that will make you grateful for modern healthcare. From mummy powder and trepanation practices to urine diagnostics and moldy bread treatments, we've certainly come a long way. And who could forget the shocking lobotomy procedures, tobacco smoke enemas, or the use of mercury in electric shock therapy? Not to mention Radithor radioactive water and the astonishing role of barber surgeons in medieval times. These strange yet fascinating facts highlight the immense progress we've made in the field of healthcare. Today, while we face our own medical challenges and advancements, it's interesting to reflect on the bizarre and sometimes downright terrifying methods of the past. It serves as a reminder of how far we've come and the importance of continued medical research and development. If you enjoyed this video, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe for more fascinating content. Until next time, stay healthy and stay curious.